What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. Today I'll be going over the running backs who have gone way up in value after the draft, or at least the draft season. We did the opposite of this video on Monday, so check that out if you've not done so already. But today I'll be looking at the biggest winners from the draft season, and I'll be focusing on redraft, although let's be honest, most of these guys, if not all of them, are winners in Dynasty as well. One shout out before we start, and there are always timestamps, by the way, if you don't care about these intros, but one quick shout out, I'll be doing live drafts every Tuesday night this summer, and I'll be starting that next week. The current plan is 8 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday night, but obviously I'll adjust if I need to each week. But yeah, uh, you guys ask every summer to be more involved in the mock drafts, and so this is your chance. Uh, I'm sure I'll screw something up, but you know now is the time to work out the kinks because I'm sure there's only going to be like 15 of you guys actually in the streams early on. So mark off your calendars, 8 p.m. Eastern each Tuesday night, and we'll do some drafts. Uh, you guys can ask any questions uh, on like players, strategy, really anything that you want. It's probably going to be only underdog drafts since the mock draft Mondays the day before are now never going to be underdog. So those will be like sleeper fantasy pros whatever format i feel like doing uh and then the tuesdays will all be underdog uh but we'll see about maybe doing some normal ones early on if we're having trouble filling the underdog drafts early in the off season but enough of that uh let's go over some big winners after the draft or the draft process so first up we've got james connor uh and i guess you can include you know benjamin in this as well honestly their only move this off season was losing Chase Edmonds, and then their only running back pick in the draft was a late sixth rounder. I'm honestly a little bit surprised that they haven't done anything. Like, Connor is a fine lead back, perfectly fine doing that. But they have very little proven talent behind him. You know, one injury means that they're probably like featuring, you know, Benjamin, and that can't be something they really want to do i have seen them talk up you know benjamin they seem to like him but i think there's a difference between liking a running back and having to rely on them as the only running back in the backfield so i still do think they could make a move in free agency or make a trade but let's be honest there are not like a bunch of great running backs just sitting there in free agency ready to get taken right there's not that many that are like super talented there's really none that we'd be scared of them getting. So it would be more if there's a surprise cut, if there is a trade. Um, we talked about the Patriots. The Patriots drafted multiple running backs and have some ones that we thought would start in the team. Do the Patriots end up doing another trade in the offseason uh, over the summer to the Arizona Cardinals? Maybe. But right now, Connor, Eno Benjamin, big winners after the draft. Miles Sanders as well. The Eagles drafted a defensive tackle, two linebackers, a center, and a tight end. And then, of course, they trade away a first-round pick in acquiring A.J. Brown. And since they haven't made any running back moves in free agency so far, their depth chart remains the same as last season. Miles Sanders, Boston Scott, and Kenneth Gainwell with Sanders as the favorite to lead the group in touches. Sanders has definitely been a disappointment since he broke out in his rookie season. But since then, eh, it's been like fine. You know, his rushing yards, receiving yards, receptions, they've all dipped in each season. And last season, you know, it was his first with less than a thousand total yards while also scoring zero touchdowns, not a single touchdown last season rushing or receiving. Most of that was fluky, though. Uh, the offense overall was just terrible in the first half of the season. And then right when he gets injured, that's when they decided, and that could have maybe caused them to decide. Um, honestly, it was like the, the Bucks game, I feel like, when they just got destroyed by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They couldn't do anything offensively. And they decided going into, I believe it was against the Lions, when they won like 45-7 to seven or something. They're like, we're switching the offense. We're not throwing the ball every play. We're going to run the ball a ton and when they switched the offense they looked a lot better okay but when they switched that was exactly when miles sanders got injured and so we didn't see him as part of that offense until later in the season but then over his five game healthy stretch to kind of close the year uh, weeks 11 through 16 
His average stat line in those games was 14.8 carries, 90.8 yards, and 1.4 receptions on top of that. And his worst game in yards per carry over that stretch was five. And again, the totals from last season, no matter where you look, early in the season, late in the season, overall, the totals don't look great. But he missed time with injury, and the offense was so bad that he never got volume early in the year. He was still solid on a per-touch basis early in the season, but the offense was so bad they could only use him so much. But it's blatantly obvious that he's their best running back, and the passing game can now be respected, right? Because you had Jalen Hurts throwing to a rookie in Devonta Smith, who's still a great player, but he was a rookie last season. And then what, Quez Watkins? Like, there was nothing to respect in the passing game. Well, now you bring in A.J. Brown. You have Devonta Smith in his second year. You've got Dallas Goddard still in his prime. Well, now defenses can't just, like, load up against the run. They're like, oh, this is a great passing attack. We have to respect this. It's going to open up more lanes for Miles Sanders. I think this could finally be the breakout Miles Sanders season. I know that we've been talking about that for a while, but this is his best chance of doing so. And it seems like they're behind him because they didn't move any, have any moves in free agency in the draft. So he is a big winner. Next up, Travis Etienne. He, of course, missed his entire rookie season last year with the Liz Frank, Liz Frank injury. Uh, so unfortunately, we haven't seen him play yet. But I think we need to understand how little competition he currently has. James Robinson is coming off the torn Achilles, right? We talk about that all the time being a massive injury. Players do not return one season after an Achilles injury. The closest thing we saw was Akers last season. And when he returned, he had like two yards per carry and clearly did not look 100% healthy. Uh, we've seen Dante Foreman return, but that was what? Like at least two seasons after the injury. James Robinson would kind of be like the first case of a player who suffers a torn ACL at the running back position and just comes back locked and loaded, looks really good. It's probably not going to happen. He's also at the very least going to miss a bunch of time in camp. And so everything sets up for ETN to be like the feature back. During the offseason, the only change was releasing Carlos Hyde, who should never have been on the roster. And then during the draft, their only pick was Snoop Connor in the fifth round. But Snoop is an unathletic early down grinder that was uninvolved in the receiving game in college and didn't really provide that much production overall in college. He is not a high-end prospect and is certainly not a threat to Etienne's workload. So we've got a former first round pick who's elite in the receiving game on a team that is clearly rebuilding the youth movement. Well, this is their first round pick. Maybe they want to get him a little bit involved and has no competition behind him. So yeah, I would say his value should be going up if they did nothing to add talent behind him to compete with him. There's just, there's no way he doesn't end up as a target for me this season, unless maybe we get a scenario where everyone falls in love with him and his ADP skyrockets. But from initial things that I've seen right now, we're going to be having him as a target. This video is not really about rookies, but I felt like I kind of had to mention James Cook here. Just really wouldn't feel right to skip over him, right? I mean, that was perfect. It was the perfect landing spot for James Cook. So many other teams, and we wouldn't even really be considering him as a target. Now, I mean, their established back is Devin Singletary, who you guys know I think is very overrated as a player. But even besides that, he goes to Buffalo. Right, He gets to play on a top three scoring offense, a top five to seven offense by any metric you look at. I would say consensus top five, probably top three offense. And not only that, it's an offense that is perfectly willing to lean pass heavy, perfectly willing to be like, hey, we don't need to run the ball. We can have James Cook out there instead of Singletary. Maybe he's not going to get that many carries, but we can use him in the receiving game. We can throw the ball, you know, 70% of plays this week. They're fine doing that, especially in games that they're playing high-scoring teams, uh, teams that have good run defenses, just games where they want to apply a bunch of pressure to the opposing offense. They're perfectly willing to just throw the ball every single play. Cook has a ton of reception upside, touchdown upside in Buffalo, and he doesn't need to overtake Singletary. That's the thing. Think what you want about Devin Singletary. James Cook does not need to overtake him to be good in fantasy. Because it's the receptions and the touchdowns that we're looking at. I don't really care that much about the rushing yardage. 
if he did overtake Singletary, oh my goodness, it would be crazy. Now, I have my concerns with James Cook, and we're going to probably go over him like twice next week. So we'll kind of touch on some of those there. Um, and it's really going to depend where his final ADP does end up going. Because if he gets hyped, you know, really, really high, we're obviously going to have to adjust our take. But just in general, he's got a ton of upside. He doesn't need to be a featured running back. I also don't think he's going to be a featured running back. So we'll touch on that next week. But just understand, it doesn't need to happen. He can still be a phenomenal pick. And regardless, his fantasy value has absolutely gone up after the draft. The other rookie I want to talk about is uh, Damian Pierce. And again, we're going to talk about him multiple times next week, I think. Uh, but he is a freak athlete. He was highly productive in college when he was used. The only knock on him was like he wasn't used all that much, right? And we can sit here and say, oh, the coaching staff was just dumb. They should have used him more. I don't know. That's kind of a tough argument for us to make, right? I mean, if, if he was some dominant threat that was going to just have the team win every single game when they were using him, they would have given him 20 touches a game, right? So there has to have been a reason that he wasn't getting a billion touches in college, right? But regardless, when he was used, he was phenomenal. And he lands in Houston, all right? His only competition is Marlon Mack and I guess Rex Burkhead, but really just Marlon Mack. So yeah, I would say that this is a really good landing spot besides, you know, being a, a bad team. Just the competition is really, really easy to overcome. Plus, you've got that core of Mills, Pierce, Mechie, Nico Collins. Obviously, not, it's not an elite core, but it's a young core. And if you're thinking about this team, why would they give Rex Burkhead touches? It makes absolutely no sense, right? Why give Marlon Mack touches? He's probably not the long-term option. Well, maybe Pierce is. And they're going to try and figure that out this season. So even if Mac is a little bit better, you have to think if they're going to go to this youth movement, figure out who their core is, Pierce, right? Pierce is going to be the guy they lean on. And there's still going to be opportunity even on a bad team. No, he's probably not going to be a running back one. But he can be valuable in fantasy, especially if he overtakes Marlon Mack as the number one. So pretty good landing spot for him there just because of the competition. Finally. Uh, the title says running back, but I felt like adding quarterback in here as well. So let's go over two quarterbacks trending up in value. First up, Jalen Hurts, uh, for many of the same reasons as Miles Sanders. I'm excited about the potential for this offense, and that's obviously a good thing for Hurts. This draft also kind of confirmed our general thoughts on their plans with Hurts, right? They're going to give him another chance this season put him in position to succeed and give him every opportunity to do so. But if he fails, they have two first round picks next season in what should be an infinitely better quarterback class. They absolutely have in the back of their minds that Jalen Hurts might not be the long-term option. That is absolutely in their minds. But why not give him a chance, right? Don't do what the Bears are doing. Throw Justin Fields out there with absolutely no talent and see if something good happens, right? They have now a core, A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard, Miles Sanders. That is a really, really, really solid core, okay? And so if he fails, it's on him at this point, and they have multiple picks next season. They can move up in the draft, or I guess it really depends on where those picks are. I mean, technically, if Jalen Hurts fails, it probably means they did bad and their pick's going to be better, right? So it kind of correlates there, um, and then it depends on how like the Saints do. But regardless, they've got picks next season. They can do something next season to address the quarterback position. But for this season, they're going to go all in with Jalen Hurts, and we'll see what happens. But that's stock up for Jalen Hurts, especially that trade for A.J. Brown. He's in position to succeed this season. Let's see if he can. Regardless, he probably doesn't have to be like a phenomenal NFL quarterback to be great in fantasy. He's already got the rushing. He's already been very productive in fantasy. You add in a top five weapon and then Devon Smith in year two, yeah, he's probably going to be really, really good this season. Stock way up. The other one's Zach Wilson. Um, if the Eagles are setting Hurts up to succeed, then we can pretty comfortably say that like the Jets are all in on Zach Wilson, right? They spent uh, a second rounder last season on Elijah Moore. Uh, wide receiver, you guys know that I love, along with a fourth rounder on Michael Carter, right? Surrounding with talent. Then this season, they spend the 10th overall pick on Garrett Wilson. 
Then the fourth pick in round two on Brees Hall, who's, you know, got a chance to be like a feature running back in this class. Then they take a tight end in the third round, even after signing both CJ Azoma and Tyler Conklin. And remember, they signed Corey Davis to a three-year deal last offseason with his 2022 salary fully guaranteed. So he's going to be part of this offense as well. That's, I mean, that's a lot of upgrades. Maybe not on the surface. Maybe you look at those names and you're like, that's not that great, right? They're not really surrounding him with that much talent. But Wilson only played four healthy games with Elijah Moore last season, six with Corey Davis. So for a good month and a half of the season, remember, Wilson also missed time. There was a good month and a half stretch last year towards the end of the year when he looked really, really bad. But his top targets were Keelan Cole, Braxton Berrios, Tyler Croft, Jeff Smith, Ty Johnson, Denzel Mims, and Ryan Griffin. So if we were going to replace those players with Elijah Moore, Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis, Brees Hall, and CJ Ozoma, maybe that you know list of names isn't top five in the NFL, but it is significantly better than the list I previously mentioned. Okay, And when you start looking at it that way, and you say, well, also, he might just get better as a player in year two, you start to understand that maybe some people are right and be excited about this Jets offense. Now I'm a Patriots fan. I'm never going to be excited about the Jets offense. And I've seen them fail infinite times. So this could absolutely go wrong. But he's set up to succeed this season. His stock is way up. Is he going to be a quarterback one? No. Is his fantasy value way up from what it was last season? Yes. So I will be back on Monday with the first mock draft Monday of the 2022 season. And then I'll be going live. 8 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday night to do some underdog drafts and answer any questions that you guys have. I'm very excited to be getting back into things this season, and we are setting up for another great season. But that, my friends, is the end of this one. Hope you all enjoy. If you did, how about hitting that like button, and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new here? Thanks for watching.